starting because somebody is entering. Good. It's Kati, so it's good. <laughs> so good evening and welcome to everybody. This is not normally how this room looks like, but it's an extraordinary situation. And we have an extraordinary interesting speaker to tell us something about the world in which we are living. As you know, these geopolitical talks uh, uh, have been going now for two years. Uh, and uh, one of the major ambitions of the Institute for Human Sciences was that we want basically to bring policy intellectuals that are trying really to study the big picture, how we see what is happening, how it is happening. And we were very privileged to have really good speakers just two weeks ago. Thomas Bagger, the foreign policy advisor of the German president, was here. Uh, we have Americans, we have Brits, we are going to have a Russian uh, speaking in two days. We have the former state secretary of the Indian foreign ministry. Uh, but then one of the reasons that uh, we always wanted to invite Mark Leonard to come is the book that uh, he just published basically some weeks ago, which is in my view one of the most ambitious attempt to try to redefine uh, the world in which we are living and what it means particularly for the European Union. The book is called The Age of Unpeace. Unpeace is a very old British word, which in Bulgaria we didn't know, uh, <laughs> but he's going to tell us with a very interesting history. Uh, but the major argument which uh, is in the book, and I do believe is really worth discussing in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this lecture, is how it happened that everything that connects us is now taking us apart. The connectivity wars is what is at the center of uh, uh, his book. And uh, it's great pleasure to introduce Mark. And I have been knowing him forever. And I really do believe that he's one of the most interesting foreign policy thinkers in Europe, but not only Europe today. And part of his quality is his incredible broadness of interests. There are people who know a lot about certain parts of the world, and they have been not interested in anything else. Uh, Mark wrote a book in the beginning of the century very much about Europe and then what he sees, the world very much going into European direction. And then he wrote a book, How Does China Think? Doing a lot of interviews with the Chinese intellectuals and trying basically to see how the world works through China. And then when he founded the European Council on Foreign Relations, I do believe this was one of the really very few European think tanks which has really interested how others are framing some of the issues of the world in which we are living. So in a way, this book is the best that you get out of this curiosity and talent to see the world from different perspective. And this is great pleasure for us to have Mark here. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand up, if that's all right, uh, to talk. And then, because um, I'm going to show you some, some slides. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say, what a huge pleasure it is to be here this evening. Um, in many ways, this, this is about the book coming home. Um, I started writing it um, in November 2016, um, and it comes from a sort of dark place, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, and I had this kind of outburst of, of writing and then wasn't able to do anything uh, with the book because it was coping with some of the post-2016 changes in the world. We were opening a, a, a big new office in Berlin on Unter den Linden. I was becoming, I was reconnecting re with my German roots and becoming German and learning German. And there was all sorts of stuff going on, which took me away from, from, from the writing of the book. And then Ivan and Cellini um, allowed me to come here to, um, to the Institute. Um, and I re-engaged with the book and uh, rediscovered it and actually rethought it. A lot had happened um, while I was uh, away from it. Um, and then Ivan um, was incredibly generous at reading several drafts of it in various stages of, of, of chaos and, and, and half-bakedness. So the, the final product bears a lot of his intellectual imprints and, and very much reflects a lot of the dialogue that we've been having for, for a long time. So there couldn't be a more appropriate place to, to discuss these things. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to the discussion this evening and I'm really happy 
to be able to, to, to come here um, now that, uh, that the book has, has, has been written. Um, and it is a, a very personal book. It's a book about the world, but um, it, in many ways, um, it is a, a, a book that's come out of my attempts to, to reconcile the fact that at, at heart, I'm a sort of an optimist. <laughs> and uh, my earlier book, which Yvonne talked about, about why Europe will run the 21st century, was a sort of expression of, of, of my commitment to, to the idea that um, binding the world together and, and creating interdependence uh, between people, between countries, can allow us to turn enemies into friends and create uh, a, a, a degree of harmony in the world. Um, so that, that's where I came from and my kind of optimistic nature. And then that colliding with a world <laughs> which seemed to, um, to favour pessimists. <laughs> and um, this book is, is an attempt to, to try and um, uh, make sense of what happened. And also, it was a journey of, of trying to work out what could still be done and to sort of rediscover some kind of hope. So though it starts in a dark place, I think it ends in a, in a more kind of hopeful one. And I'm going to just exp try and use some of the, these slides to, to talk you through a bit of that, that story. Um, and it is a, a kind of big geopolitical story about how geopolitics has taken over large chunks of the world and has, have, has infiltrated many parts of our lives that we didn't think of as geopolitical before. And that's why it has this somewhat portentous title of the, the age of, of unpeace. Anyway, when most people think about geopolitics at the moment, the big story in, in recent times uh, has been this uh, picture, which is um, the, the sort of so a heartbreaking picture of uh, the American plane taking off from uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport, Airplay, Airport with Afghans, civilians sort of climbing onto it, many of whom um, end up uh, falling off the plane, some of whom even die. And that, in some ways, was seen as the brutal way in which the bodies were cast off was seen as a, a sort of reflection of, of President Biden's determination to end the, the forever wars. Um, I think the fact that so many people got upset about it was not just empathy with the human tragedy of Afghans who, who saw their life chances destroyed. They were also mourning something else because the other thing, you know, it wasn't just human bodies that were left behind on the tarmac at Hamid Karzai International Airport. It was also a dream of a different kind of world, of a, a liberal international order with the West at its heart that was able to spread democracy to distant parts of the world. Um, and that kind of dream ended. Um, but I, I think it's also worth um, understanding as well that that whole idea of thinking about geopolitics uh, only um, tells us a very small amount about, about what is actually going on in the world. And the, 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 the thing which I find most important to, to realise is that we might be seeing the end of the forever wars, but it doesn't mean that we're going to have peace. And to understand why that is the case, I think we need to look at some of the other geopolitical stories, which maybe don't always look that geopolitical, which have taken place over the last couple of years. So I'm just going to shoot through a few of these stories because I think they tell us quite a lot more about the nature of geopolitics than the Afghan story, which we've been talking about. So this is the most obvious one, COVID-19. Um, when the virus first struck, the Chinese government... Um, hoarded medicines, masks, PPE, and when it kind of spread further, these supplies were, were used to bribe and to blackmail. Um, and the basic assumption that we had was that something like this, which comes from the outside, threatens all of humanity, would bring the, the world together. But instead, we, we ended up with, with vaccine nationalism, with mask diplomacy, and we saw that how COVID had the, the opportunity to, to divide as well as to unite. 
So another kind of big picture of the last couple of years that the shows that the, the sort of toxic connections between places are not just about, about trade. When This is the Black Lives Matter movement. When um, the Black Lives Matter protests raged over the George Floyd murder, there was a wave of African social media posts calling for violence against the fascist police. And to a casual observer, it looked like a, a global political awakening. But later on, people discovered that these tweets were in fact orchestrated by troll factories in Ghana and Nigeria, many of which were funded by the, the Russian state. Um, another story here, the, the Huawei story, shows that the sort of conflict over technology is um, increasingly um, becoming uh, a, a, a one of the big stories of our age. Google and Huawei worked together very closely for years, building a very successful partnership between the world's biggest handset maker and its most widely used operating system. But when China um, and America um, escalated their relationship in the technology realm, America put Huawei on a banned list and uh, you know that that relationship sort of breaks down millions of people can't update their phones and then China reciprocates by creating its own entities lists um, so another um, story of the last couple of years is British supermarkets um, this was uh, this picture was taken in December 2020 when British supermarkets ran out of, um, of fruit and vegetables because the French government closed its borders. Um, President Macron said that this was uh, an attempt to stop uh, COVID from crossing the, the, and the Delta variant from crossing the channel. The way that the British government interpreted it had more to do with the, the Brexit endgame, which was reaching its, uh, its apex at that time. Um, and here's another story. This is uh, an Iranian uh, ship. Um, uh, and it's a story that shows um, the Iranian Navy seizing oil tankers uh, in the Gulf, a Korean oil tanker. Um, the reason it was doing it, why did this kind of ancient civilization resort to, 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 to piracy? Um, the main reason was to try and break international support for a financial blockade, which was putting enormous pressure on, on the government. Um, that is, is not the Belarusian border, it's the Turkish border, but it could be uh, a more contemporary uh, picture at the moment, but it's um, uh, a picture of um, of the um, the the Turkish uh, Greek uh, border um, at a time when the Turkish president was urging many Syrians to to seek a better life in Europe. His goal wasn't really to uh, help them follow their dreams, but rather to use the threat of a, threat, uh, of a wave of, of refugees to extort concessions from the European Union. Um, here's another um, uh, picture, uh, photos of, of wildfires in the Amazon, shocked lots of, of international observers, made people uh, very worried about, about climate change and what the destruction of the rainforest was, is doing towards that. Unfortunately, one of the people who wasn't shocked was, was uh, President Bolsonaro, who in fact <laughs> saw this as an opportunity to try and blackmail the rest of the world and extort um, uh, the West for payments of, uh, of, of, of billions of dollars in order to, to, to stop them from, um, uh, from clearing as much of the, the rainforests. Anyway, if you put all of these pictures together, they're pictures of, of different events happening in disparate continents. Some are about companies, some are about governments, some happen in the... Uh, <laughs> In, uh, in the sea, some on the land, um, but they all have something in common. Um, and if you look at the thread that links Chinese bullying, Russian trolling, American regulation, French blockades, uh, Iranian piracy, Turkish border policy, Brazilian blackmail, the thing that they have in common was that these were not random accidents that happened, like an asteroid falling from the sky or an earthquake, but they're all new types of political violence. And each is a weapon that has been perfectly evolved to exploit a weakness in our connected world. And what we're seeing now is, a, is an epidemic of these types of political violence which are breaking out 
and each time one country uses one, another reciprocate, reciprocates, and that is in danger of creating a deadly spiral of tensions uh, between different countries. And the book that I've written, The Age of Unpeace, is a, a sort of short volume with a, a simple idea. And that idea is that the connections that knit the world together are also driving it apart. In a world where um, war between nuclear powers is, is too dangerous even to contemplate, countries are waging conflict by manipulating the very things that link them together. And um, the... This is, I think, quite a, a sort of painful thing to, 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 to confront, particularly for Europeans. I, I talked about my kind of intellectual belief in the European project. It also comes from a kind of personal belief because of my own family history. Um, but unfortunately, um, what we're having to confront is, is this kind of reality of how interdependence is, in fact, creating conflict in all sorts of different places. Um, the conventional wisdom is that we live in a, in a golden age of, of peace uh, because we haven't seen a great power war for, for many conflicts. But um, I think that some of the examples I've shown you and thousands more over the last few years show that underneath the surface of uh, a formal peace between countries. You have an enormous amount of tension and violence that's ripping through the world every day. And in fact, doing much more damage to the world than armed warfare does. Only 70,000 people have died every year for the last decade from armed warfare. Many more people commit suicide every, every year than die in kind of wars between countries. But hundreds of millions of people um, are victims of some of the sort of uh, connectivity conflicts, which I'm going to talk about more later on. And I tried to, to, to find a way of describing uh, what, what is going on. And I think there is this word which captures our liminal condition, which is suspended somehow between a state of war and a state of peace. Academics like Lucas Kello, who work on cyber, try to describe this grey zone in which their world was immersed, where every day you have millions of attacks that fall short of, of, of conventional war, and they rehabilitated this beautiful Anglo-Saxon word, unpeace. And I think uh, as violence spreads from the weaponization of the internet to all facets of globalization, that word provides a very good encapsulation of this condition and of what it's like to live with an unstable, crisis-prone world of perpetual competition and endless attacks between competing powers. So, um, yeah, welcome to the Age of Unpeace. Um, in the Age of Unpeace, uh, global politics has become like a loveless marriage where the couple can't stand each other's company but can't get divorced. And just as with an unhappy couple, it's the things which brought them together during the good times that become the means that they use to harm each other during the bad ones. In a collapsing marriage, vindictive partners will use the children, the dog, the holiday home to hurt each other. But in, in geopolitics, um, the, the, the new battlegrounds are, um, in fact, all the things that were meant to bring us together. Economics and finance, health, infrastructure, technology, climate, migration. Um, all of the big forces that were designed to, that we hoped would create one world, are in fact now being turned at best into currencies of power, at worst into weapons of, um, of mass destruction. So just going to race through some of them uh, at a time. This is um, economics and, and finance. We've seen many countries using or threatening to use sanctions, boycotts, export controls, import bans for political goals. This slide shows only a few examples. Sorry, it's the wrong, it's the wrong one. Economics and finance. Like um, uh, China's threat of introducing car tariffs to pressure Germany into accepting Huawei's 5G infrastructure. Turkish boycott of French label goods following President Macron's announcement of policies for, for fighting extremism in France. Um, this is health. Uh, something which should obviously bring the planet together, but as I said earlier, we, we talk, we've seen instead mass diplomacy, vaccine nationalism. This map shows that in 98 countries, um, 
people have, uh, have been active on this battlefield of health by introducing export restrictions and bans on, um, on the export of particular products rather than coming together. Um, an another battleground is infrastructure. China is undisputably the, the most visible power on that battlefield. This is a map of the Belt and Road Initiative, which China is building to link its economy to 65 countries and increase its political power by be creating economic dependency and a digital silk road, which, which um, binds lots of countries into, uh, into a relationship with China. Um, technology, uh, I, as I said earlier, is maybe the kind of most important battlefield, which is not just about technological influence, spheres of influence, and who sets standards in different areas. It's also very much about the freedom of our societies and democracy. ASPE's International Cyber Policy Center has identified 41 elections and seven referendums over the last decade that have been subject to, to cyber-enabled foreign interference um, and information operations. Um, climate, as I said, is, is also becoming an important battlefield. Um, we thought that nothing would unite the world more strongly than, than, than climate, that we would move towards uh, a situation um, where um, um, uh, increasingly uh, science rather than emotion dictated what decisions were made, law rather than power would determine uh, what people did, and global cooperation would take the place of national interests. But in fact, the, the opposite um, has happened and, and increasingly uh, people are trying to game the system. This is a, a map of, of what would happen if you had carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which is sort of one of the things which I think Europeans need to do to, to, to advance um, their agenda on, on the European stage, but which is going to be seen as a kind of aggressive act by many people and a protectionist one. Um, and a lot of the countries uh, in... in um, uh, in green on that map are going to be the ones who are most affected. Um, we talked earlier about, about migration, um, uh, and I showed you that picture of, about Turkey, but we can't uh, look at the news at the moment without seeing what's happening on the Belarusian-Polish border. Um, but what's happening there is, is not a new thing. This is a map of all the countries that have used, where you've seen um, migration used as a weapon over the last few decades. Um, there are over 75 instances um, since uh, 1951 where that's happened, at least one every year. Um, and what's very interesting is how devastatingly effective it's been. Um, this is the, how, uh, this slide shows uh, how effective uh, this has been compared to, um, uh, uh, so, you know, 60, uh, two-thirds of them have managed to achieve their political goals. Um, uh, and then also military and, and, um, and economic objectives. So uh, by what, if you compare uh, migration as a weapon to sanctions and war, it's been vastly more effective um, over the last few decades. Anyway, so that's, those are the sort of battlegrounds where it's playing out. Um, in my book, I also try and look at some of the ways and the techniques which countries have, have used to weaponize migration. And I sort of come up with these seven habits of highly effective connectivity warriors. Um, it's very much influenced by network theory. But basically, the, the main uh, starting point is that instrumentalizing connections between countries isn't new. You know, you can go back to the Peloponnesian Wars to see sanctions in action. But what is new is the, the kind of dense networks which link our world together. And um, uh, they give... Um, uh, these different techniques, uh, a viral quality and a, a kind of deadly nature which earlier uh, eras uh, didn't have. Um, Tom Friedman uh, might have said that the network world was going to be flat, but in fact it, it's not at all flat. Some countries are much more connected than others and it's by manipulating um, these interdependencies that countries have been exercising their power. Um, I'm just going to um, talk a, a little bit about um, some of the new divides in that world. And my kind of argument in the book is that rather than thinking about the world as a bipolar one or a kind of ungovernable chaos of a nonpolar world, what we're seeing emerge is a, is a sort of four world order where you have three empires of connectivity with fundamentally different ideas about how to organize the planet. The US, the gatekeeper power that tries to put itself 
um, uh, in a position where it can shut other countries in and out of its networks uh, through the dollar, through control of the internet. China, which is a sort of relational power that is trying to, to, to build relations of dependence with many countries so that it can be the, the, um, the kind of middle kingdom. And Europe, which sees itself as a, as a sort of role-making, a rule-making power. Um, and then the fourth world all around that of countries that, that don't live in, in the US, China, or the European Union, and who don't want to be uh, dictated to by these powers um, and, uh, and are trying to exploit some of the cracks in the system as well. Um, I'm just going to end very briefly and maybe we can talk about it more in the discussion with, with what we should do about it. When I first started writing the book, I originally intended to make a passionate plea for, for an open world and I hoped to design a new architecture for a more uh, united planet. But the deeper I delved, the more I became aware that the good and the bad features of connectivity are inextricably entwined, and that it's impossible to untangle them without destroying many of the biggest advances in our civilization. And I had an epiphany about the dilemma facing our world on one of my trips to Beijing. While I was browsing in my favorite bookshop there, The Bookworm, I came across a volume called Facing Codependence by an American author called Pia Melody, which I thought captured all of the pathologies that beset contemporary politics and international relations. And rather than talking about interdependence as a balance phenomenon, what it identified was a condition called codependence, during which the ties between different players become toxic, but also inescapable. And um, her diagnosis of our condition was one which was rooted in the pathology, not of individual people or countries, but in the nature of the relationships between them. And it showed that the problems and the tensions are intrinsic to the global system we've been created, that we've created and can be managed and channeled, but not eliminated. Um, and I think most importantly, she kind of starts with the lived reality of people who are experiencing that world, rather than a set of ideas about how it should be. My only surprise uh, about that book was that I found it in the, in the self-help section of the bookshop rather than in the international politics one. And that's when I realized that what we really need for the 21st century are not architects who can come up with a great new grand design for an open world, but therapists who can actually help us develop strategies for shaping and surviving our new reality. And in the Cold War, people realized that the biggest threat to humanity was the nuclear arms race, which could spiral out of control. And they tried to use the, that escalation to build trust, to gradually build the weapons, bring the weapons that threaten to wipe out humanity um, under control. Our own dilemma, I think, is much greater, because in the age of unpeace, everything can be uh, weaponized. Um, and all the violence that we have flies under the radar of war and is therefore unregulated. And because it can't be trapped in a few deadly technologies that can be counted, surveyed and controlled, um, it's incredibly hard to, to get a handle on it. But I think what we can see through that is the, the, the sort of generational struggle that we have, which is the equivalent of arms control during the Cold War, is about trying to um, make these connections which bind our world together less dangerous than they are at the moment. And I come up with a, with a kind of five-step therapy program for this age of unpeace based around this kind of big idea of disarming connectivity. And I argue in the book, and I feel this very strongly, is that, that it's very wrong to see the, the kind of dilemma of our age as a choice between an open world and a closed world. Instead, what we need to do is to think more clearly about how we can have... Uh, managed um, interdependence rather than unmanaged interdependence and to, to develop uh, ways of having healthier boundaries between countries, being more realistic about what we, we can control and a different approach to all of the different areas which bind us together, which can make um, our connected world a bit less dangerous than it is. Um, and I think that it's urgent that we face up to that because a lot of the trends that I've described could actually end up taking us to a very dark place, maybe an even darker place than our conventional dystopias about war between great powers. 
And um, as with all psychological maladies, the, the first step towards uh, doing anything about it is to recognise that there's a problem, and that's really what the essential purpose of my book was. It's, a, it's an intervention. Thank you. There is one more reason, basically, that it's a great place to present the book. When it comes to therapists, I do believe that Vienna is very open uh, <laughs> to this type of solutions. Uh, we have basically 40, 45 minutes uh, for a discussion, and uh, I'll just ask two questions, and uh, which uh, are important for me, uh, basically, just to start this conversation, and just we immediately go back to you. My first is that you're talking about world in which basically different states and non-state actors are weaponizing. But what I find it even more kind of a dangerous is the fact that this weaponization does not need to be part of a great strategy. Uh, for example, the, the example of the, what happened on the Polish-Belarusian border uh, was given as an example. And honestly speaking, I always believe that revenge is much more art than science. Uh, so when uh, President Lukashenko decided to basically seduce these poor people from Africa and Middle East, promising them that they are going easily to enter the European Union, I don't believe that there was a grand strategy. There was just the desire to hurt the European Union for its support for the, uh, basically for the Belarusian popular movement. So you don't know what you're going to achieve, but you basically want to hurt. But as a result of it, several things start happening. And for me, the most important one is that European Union start fearing what before it, it was proud of how attractive you are to others. In a certain way, soft power of the European Union is what we started to fear most. I don't believe, I have met Mr. Lukashenko back in years. I don't see a great chess player in him, probably I'm wrong. Uh, so I don't believe that this is what he had in mind, but at the end of the day, this is what happened. Basically, European Union was scared that the more people liked us, the bigger the problem for us is. Because he did not convince these people to go to the European Union. He was with the logistic support. Uh, and for me, this is the story of how we're doing this when basically weaponization is much more like exactly epidemics in which basically different actors are infecting each other. Then basically we're talking about the rational strategies. And the second one is I like very much this uh, psychotherapeutic approach. The problem is who decides who is the therapist? Because my feeling is that we all try to see the others as people with problems. Europeans, we basically try to analyze Chinese politics, Russian politics, and so on, and finding a lot of basically insanity there. But nobody wants to treat you as a patient. So from this point in this world, there is the therapist should be outside of the situation. And out of this age of peace, there is no outside. And this is my story where the therapist comes from. Um, I mean, I, I think um, until the, the I mean, I, what you said was, was brilliant and I agreed very much with, with, with everything you were saying about, about Lukashenko and, um, and the way that you end up accidentally having this this contagion with, I mean, that's what's fa so fascinating about what happens. It was European sanctions against Belarus, which leads to him trying to turn uh, migrants into bullets to kind of fight back. And then we bring in more sanctions and, and uh, you have all these other types of connectivity wars happening around it. The, the sort of inf the battle to define what's going on, where he's trying to create this simulacra of 2015 and wage psychological warfare against Europeans and the Russians are um, also um, doing all sorts of things around it and gas is being I mean you have all of these different things which which end up playing off each other and, and it shows how you can have a rapid escalation which feels cost free because none of it fits into conventional uh, patterns where um, you can see a path to, to, to nuclear war, and that's why people are much more cautious um, if, you've, uh, if, if you're operating in a sort of traditional territory compared to an area of unpeace where it all feels relatively cheap and easy. 
but you can end up creating a huge amount of damage very quickly and these things can, can take off. And so far we're very lucky in that none of these things have, have taken on existential proportions, but it's not that hard to imagine how they could do in, an, in a sort of accidental way. In terms of the, the question about who the therapist is, I mean, you know, you saw that I was talking about self-help and I think that is essentially how the world is, is sort of helping itself is that we're moving from a unipolar world where um, we thought that there was a kind of external therapist who, um, who might have been slightly dictatorial and, and might have done things which were not always consensual, but, but who did try and control it towards a situation where how is other people and you try and regulate your relationships with other people to make to to minimize the the, the difficult contact that you have with them um and that's why actually the kind of light motif of politics everywhere is more about self-help in america it's about building back better better and about a foreign policy for the middle classes rather than going around reordering the whole world in china they're talking about dual circulation and building a different kind of economy, which is much more driven by domestic demand and indigenous innovation, and much less reliant on links with other players. And in Europe, we're talking increasingly about strategic autonomy and European sovereignty. Um, and, you know, whether or not these things are real, it's kind of interesting that the more people talk about decoupling, the more trade there is between China and America. Um, <laughs> But the way that people think about these relationships is very different. And I think they are being structured in a different way. And, and you know, as the poet Robert Frost said, good fences make um, good neighbours. That is the hope. The positive scenario is that actually we might end up um, creating a bit more distance, which will make people feel a bit more secure about themselves. The downside is that would be if you, people maintain their universalist aspirations and their hopes of, of transforming everybody else. Because if that happens in an interconnected world where we're so closely bound together, then every single point of contact with, with, with each other becomes a site for systemic rivalry and means that you, you're conflicting everywhere from like whatever you, uh, you were talking about whether it's our healthcare systems or our mobile phone systems. I mean, everything becomes a, a kind of threat and becomes a channel with which other people might try and change us and transform us. And that leads to, to a kind of degree of paranoia and, and, uh, and uncertainty, which has certainly infected our politics and is, is I think, responsible for a lot of, of what's going on at the moment. So I, I do think that, that, um, uh, the best hopes that we have are that, that, that there is a degree of, of self-help and self-care and trying to build stronger, more resilient um, societies which have more options and more choices and are therefore less liable to, to be blackmailed by others and are therefore less scared about interacting with others. Um, I mean, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not difficult to see that not happening and to see lot, much more much darker things going on but i think that that's more likely to to save us than finding some some sort of third party because as you're saying the big difference between now and the cold war and other area, eras is that everyone's bound together into a into a single system there is nothing outside it and all of the things that we thought would regulate it from outside international institutions international law in fact, part of the problem, they've all been weaponized. They don't stand outside of it. They don't have an, a, a legitimacy um, which really allows them to, to tell governments what to do. And uh, I think that to the extent that we can develop some system which steps outside of it, it's gonna be a very limited and a thin system. It could be, as in the Cold War, that you have rules for some of the most deadly technologies and interactions to make sure that we don't completely destroy the whole planet. But even you know, COP26, which is about our survival as a human race, shows how, how hard it is to, to get countries to step outside of a competitive mindset and to, to actually focus on their sort of common survival. So I think that 
from a European perspective, we have to be much more uh, modest and humble about what we're going to achieve through these global institutions and through international law and put more of our energy into to trying to, to, to build things uh, amongst ourselves as Europeans um, and to, 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 to make our own societies work better and, and to become more resilient. Thank you very much. So, Ralph, you were, no, no, you were the first didn't know it was so quick. Well, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, inspirational as ever. There's so much. Can uh, you, can you re re just, oh, just people just to say Introduce, yeah. I'm Ralf Beste. I'm the German ambassador in Austria. Um, uh, yeah, it was it inspired me to, to say so many things. I try to focus on, um, on, 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 on one core issue because you, you mentioned the topic of therapy. And I think the, the therapists that I'm friends with regularly need to go into supervision and have themselves checked <laughs> regarding their own sanity. And I wonder if um, we as Europeans speak about um, the world needs therapy, we shouldn't like question ourselves first what we do about our state of mind. Because the way that we perceive, and you aptly accentuate that, sometimes exaggerate how, how all these vulnerabilities come to play to our detriment and so on, is that aren't we a bit too hysterical in, in, in perceiving these threats? Um, look, at, look at what's happening at the Belarusian border. You could as well say there's a few hundred migrants and it's, and it's, a, it's a very difficult situation, but is that really the weaponization of people? That's not, um, that's not the great migration being reenacted. Um, sometimes I feel that our inclination to, um, to indignation, <laughs> to outrage, is so big that it really hampers our ability to have a cool-headed view on what the relation, what the scale, what, what the effect of whatever is happening. So maybe we're not in an age of peace, of course, but it's not as unpeaceful as we think. Sometimes we are suddenly just feeling a certain backlash that we foreign policy was something that we did on others and now others do something to us and we aren't really used to that we feel the heat of other people's actions to the extent that we do now. So I think we may have to, to reconsider, call it therapy or whatever, what, um, how we could be more cool-headed in our analysis and also in the threat assessment so that we can act more cool-headed in, in the way that you describe it. Yeah, I think that's very perceptive, and I, I agree um, strongly with with that. The, um, the I mean, it, I think the the nature of conflict is changing because of interdependence. So actually, what Lukashenko is doing is not threatening to flood Poland and Lithuania with a few hundred people, but he is waging psychological warfare, um, and he's reenacting stuff which was a real trauma from a couple of years ago and creating a kind of pale simulacra of 2015 in these perfectly made television things and, and is provoking different reactions. Um, and that, you know, is, is how international politics plays out increasingly now. But I, I do think at the same time that just because we haven't, you know, ended with the sort of cataclysmic results that uh, we got in the First and the Second World War yet doesn't mean that we should be um, blind to the dangers of, of unpeace going on uncontrolled because actually um, the fact that we don't even think about it means that we don't recognize these things. You don't have body bags coming back, we don't have military graveyards, but if you look at uh, it's something which nobody's done systematically. It was beyond my skills as a researcher to work out what the body count from connectivity wars is. But I kind of did a very artisanal look at some of these different areas. And if you start looking in all of the areas I talked about, whether it's sanctions, the number of people who have been killed as a result of, of sanctions, the number of people whose jobs have been lost, the amount of, of the lives that have been destroyed as a result of sanctions. If you look at the number of people who've been hurt by, um, uh, you know, cyber crimes, um, by uh, and what could happen if you listen to the the, the sort of accounts of, of cyber experts. If you look at the the human count 
from some of these weaponized migration um, um, uh, situations. Um, but also, if you look at the costs of us w gaming and weaponizing climate change discussions, discussions around COVID, it does start to mount up pretty quickly. And it's not hurting tens of thousands of people like wars are at the moment. It's literally hundreds of millions of people who are being negatively affected all over the world. And that's before something really catastrophic happens. Um, but, you know, after COVID, um, it's not that hard to imagine a sort of layering of some sort of uh, uncontrolled escalation of, of a sort of grey conflict that tanks the global economy, um, you know, that being overlaid by, you know, the mass migrations as a result of, of climate change, pandemics spreading around the world. I mean, you can sort of work out all sorts of ways that this could become very dangerous. And it's totally unregulated because none of this stuff is being treated in the serious way that we think about war and peace. Um, so you don't get the self-restraints or any of the guardrails that you have for more familiar geopolitical challenges. And I think that th that is something that we need to, to face up to and, and, and act on now before it's too late. Because, um, because of the sort of viral way that it spreads, you could see these things taking off in, in quite terrifying ways um, in, in the future. Um, but I very much agree with, with your sense that, you know, often the method is, in fact, and, and Ivan made that point brilliantly about the EU, the, the, the dream is, in fact, to, to, in a kind of judo-like way to, to use people's strengths against them and to use connectivity so that we end up kind of defeating ourselves. And that's definitely, well, in fact, it was even true of the great kind of migration in 2015. It was also not uh, something which was which was actually ever really threatening our, our ability to cope. Sorry? It was a political crisis, and it had enormous political implications. It could have been much greater, but it obviously wasn't something which was on a, on a scale like you know, 19th century population movements or all the sorts of population movements that you got in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, can I make one point before going? Because uh, part of it is also COVID effect. Do you think in terms of potential destruction? Uh, for example, of course, this is just totally minor type of uh, figures we're talking about. But is it not true also for the number of people dying in our countries and basically you go with this type of a preventive policies because you try to imagine what is going to be the exponential growth. And if you read the climate uh, reports, you're going to see that in year 2017, According to one of the scenarios, 30 billion people were going to be unable to live in the places in which they're living now. So then, of course, nobody is talking about these 300 people or 3,000 people. The problem is that everything is an indication what is going to happen when basically hundreds of millions starts moving. And I do believe this play of imagination, as a result of it, is also one of the characteristic of and peace. But sorry for taking time. And who is the next speaker? Thank you very much for this um, spirited uh, conversation and um, provoking conversation too. Uh, forgive my sore throat. <coughs> I don't have anything, but... <laughs> um, uh, actually, you, you really look at these very big pictures, which really makes me feel happy because on Monday I will just flip the picture the other <laughs> way. So thank you for starting this conversation in this way. And so let me just ask you, uh, are we really overly connected? I, I have the impressions in the past 10, 15 years that we went the other way. Uh, and just because of the of COVID, we had this moment where there's intensifications of scientific collaborations that really led us to find finally RNA vaccines that is perhaps going to save the world, perhaps. We don't know yet because we're in another wave as, we, as I speak. So aren't you just offering a therapy that seems to be already what's going on, one that speaks to 
isolationism, to economic protectionism, to detachment, setting more border. You don't quite say that, but I'm wondering, because that's really the background that has happened with the rise of populism and nationalism. And if it's not that, then what is the goal of the therapy? Not just the therapy in itself, but the goal of the therapy, what is that thelos that you wish to achieve? Because we can always have a conversations about disengagement, but to what extent should we disengage? And where do we go when we disengage in a world that he's actually suffering from all the calamity and the plagues and the problems that you have spelled out so well? So my goal is, is absolutely not isolation and disengagement. I mean, I, I didn't go big on my own kind of personal uh, history, but the life which I have is one which was sort of unimaginable for, for my parents or their parents. Um, and, you know, every aspect of my life, personal, professional, um, emotional, cultural, intellectual, uh, is a product of, 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 of the enormous riches that come from connections with the rest of the world. And um, I love the way that um, our societies have been changed through that connectivity so much that I wrote this book about why Europe will run the 21st century, which is a love letter to, 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 to that project. Um, and it, you know, it's something I feel really deeply at a personal level, because my, my family history, in fact, is uh, my identity is unimaginable. I can't understand myself without thinking about these connections, because um, my mother is, comes from German Jewish parents. She was born in France during the war. She married my father, who, who's kind of British. And I got relatives all over the place. Everyone speaks different languages. Um, and to the extent that I've been involved in the construction of any national stories, I, I got involved in a lot of debates about Britishness and kind of tried to redefine Britishness as this story of connection and hybridity and the kind of Mongol nation and celebrating all of those different things and telling a civic rather than an ethnic or religious version of what Britishness was and, and, and got quite involved in British politics in that way. But um, what was a big shock to me was in 2016 when I realised that almost everything I loved about, about what's happened during my lifetime um, you could find people who just experienced every single thing that I thought was great and wonderful in exactly the opposite way. And their level of re revulsion and hostility and insecurity was co perfectly correlated with my sense of, of joy and amazement and, and opportunity. And, you know, I think... Uh, when 52% of people in your country vote for, for Brexit and say that they kind of feel that way, you have to kind of ask yourself some questions about how wonderful this, this period of opportunity and, and civilization uh, really was. And you can talk about their false consciousness and about how they followed Boris Johnson's lies and how the Russians kind of interfered in the, in the referendum and do all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, lots of people did. Um, and some of that might even be tr quite true, and it might even have affected the result. But at the same time, you can't get away from the fact that a lot of people have experienced the coming together of the world in the, over the last, uh, after the end of the Cold War as something which is profoundly destabilizing, which deprives them of agency, which makes them feel like strangers in their countries. I mean, that's what they're telling us. Um, so economically, you know, it's obviously created winners and losers. Wages have stagnated as well as, uh, as, as, well as grown. Um, you know, um, culturally, people have felt kind of insecure. There are all these different things going on. And the question really is um, what, what, what lessons we should draw from that. And my sort of feeling is that if you don't want the lesson to be about autarky and about building walls and about Trump and about Brexit and those sorts of things, how can we make the good things that we love about living together and about interdependence less scary to lots of people? 
And I think the starting point is to not just think of it as great, because a lot of people don't think it's great. <laughs> um, and not to talk about it as a win-win situation, which everyone benefits from. And so one of the phenomena I talk about in my book is this kind of Esperanto economics, where if you, because if you look at things from a, from a cosmopolitan perspective, from a planetary perspective, obviously you can tell a story about everything being great over the last few decades. On the, you know, one of the reasons why the Brexit debate was so catastrophic is because people who are on the Remain side, you know, have got vast amounts of data which can show that Britain is a much richer country than it was before. Um, we desperately need people to come from other places. To Our health service would collapse uh, tomorrow if, if, if all the nurses and doctors went home. None of the fruit that gets grown in our fields, none of our food would be in the supermarket shelves without people coming in. Nobody would look after old people. The old country would come grinding to a halt. We'd be poorer, we'd be, you know. So you can show how in the aggregate we, we we're a lot better off. There are loads of data that show with migration, which was the most tricky issue, that, that there's a big net benefit to our coffers. People paid much more taxes than they received in benefits, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, the lived experience of many people is the opposite of that. They see people coming into their communities, um, uh, driving up house prices in some parts of the country, driving down wages in some sectors like construction, etc. And if you actually um, hear them and listen to them, then what you'd have done was like have a vastly different way of, of being an EU member state over the last three decades. So you wouldn't, as Tony Blair did, say, oh, don't worry about immigration, only 13,000 people will come, you know, before one and a half million people uh, come you might actually track where people went in the country rather than having a completely laissez-faire system. Because if you know where they are, then you can make sure that there's more money for, to build schools and hospital places so that you don't put extra pressure on public services for people who are settled down. You might look at the minimum wage and how it works in different sectors so that wages don't get depressed in different areas. You might train up people who are in danger of being left behind in different places. Um, anyway, Essentially, this is just a microcosm of the kind of macro problem, which is that if you assume that connectivity, that globalization, that independence is a good thing and that we all benefit from it, then you can just let everything happen and, um, and, and, um, and do nothing uh, to, to, to reassure uh, the people who are left. But whereas if you think, actually, this is a wonderful thing which will give us incredible things, but it's also a really dangerous thing that's going to hurt a lot of people and going to create a lot of chaos and disjunctions and uh, disruptions in our societies. And it needs to be managed. And you're aware that there are winners and losers and that um, there are dangers of uh, relationships being built in ways which allow you to be blackmailed or hurt or infiltrated, etc then you'll go about handling it in a very different way. And that's what I want to go towards, is a thing where we're much more self-reflexive, where we think, OK, if there are winners, how do you tax them and get hold of some of the, the benefits of, 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 uh, of it and then redistribute it to the losers? How do we structure relationships in a way that they're not one-sided? So, you, you know, you, you have multiple gas suppliers, multiple people who can give you um, uh, 5G networks so that you're not in a position where you can be bullied or forced to do things by, by third powers. How do we make sure that we have choice over different things? And I think at all the different levels, you, could, you would structure interdependence uh, differently so that it's more balanced, so that it's healthier, so that um, you have options um, if people try and take advantage of, the, of the, the links that you have with other players. And I think that would be a much healthier world. And it might be a world which is maybe a bit less connected in some ways than, uh, than it is at the moment. But the goal is to try and keep interdependence rather than to destroy it. But by building it on sort of firmer foundations and trying to get real consent for, for, for what's uh, going on at the moment. And that was not the approach which 
which elites had until very recently. And for, you know, another, I use Brexit and the EU as one example. Another example, which is like even more baffling, was like TTIP, which was the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which was designed to bring the Atlantic together at a stage where the, the Soviet Union had disappeared as a glue to bind the Atlantic together. And we thought what we could do is liberalize our markets. And um, what we're doing was creating, you know, a, um, a, a type of interdependence with very few benefits, like almost negligible um, in terms of the, the economic benefits in the aggregate. Um, and at the cost of a lot of policy space, so that people were having to change the way that they thought about things which they really cared about. So in the UK, there was a big debate about how TTIP could destroy the National Health Service, which is the, the, the closest we have to a, to a religion in, in, in this largely secular country that, that I spend a lot of my time in. Um, in Germany, people were very worried about being forced to eat chlorinated chickens, um, which uh, essentially, by trying to create interdependence in a way that was kind of not respectful of people's policy space, what you ended up doing was creating a lot of hostility towards the US rather than um, re-cementing this relationship. And I think that that's, uh, you know, quite a good metaphor for how a, a lot of the thinking about interdependence and globalization was going awry, um, you know, certainly until 2008 um, and, 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 and before COVID. And, and as you say, we're now kind of course correcting but I think in a very helpful way, because if we can get it right, and if progressive people who believe in, in um, uh, having a, a much more united world where we you know, don't just live in, in kind of national silos um, can make interdependence less risky, then it will, it will survive. But if not, there is a danger either that it becomes weaponized in some of the ways that I was talking about earlier, or that you do end up, as we did after the last great coming together of the world, seeing it destroyed in, as we did in 19, uh, you know, after the First World War, when people found that interdependence had become so kind of risky and dangerous that it had to be scaled back. And I think that's the, the danger with the course that we, were, that, we were, that we have been on and that we were on. And I think Trump and Brexit were, were really important warning signals. Um, and it, you know, it could have gone either way. Hillary could easily have won if a few thousand people had voted the other way. If, if, if a very small number of people had changed sides in the Brexit referendum, we might have still have stayed in the EU. But um, the dynamics in those two countries are not a million miles away from the dynamics in France, in Poland, in other places where you have these bifurcated societies and where many people are, are, are actually trying to push back completely on the project of interdependence. Thank you very much. We're going to have uh, all the questions now because in 15 minutes we should be over. So this is why, who is interested? So we have three persons, yeah, four, please. Uh, Keith Krauss from the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Um, so th this was a fascinating discussion, and I'm sorry that you didn't elaborate a little bit more on one of your slides that had the, the seven red bubbles, which was basically the, the weaponization part, and, and they've disappeared. Um, but I found, first off, connectivity always, uh, and interdependence always has winners and losers, as you pointed out. So I'm not altogether sure what the argument is for how we can have a healthier, cleaner, more sustainable, nicer, gentler, kinder <laughs> interdependence. And, and you noted World War I, of course, as part of this. And, and the, the highest percentage of trade as a, uh, as a percentage of global GDP was, of course, before that war. And the technological revolutions that occurred before 1914 were all about connectivity, whether it was steam and rail and ships and telegrams and various things like that. So, so we, we, I don't believe history repeats itself, but we have seen some of the consequences of these phenomena before. Um, I think the, the geopolitical part of your argument is actually very interesting, and I'd ask you to elaborate a little bit on that, because if I were, which I'm not, just a standard 
bog standard realist scholar of international relations, I would say, well, welcome to the club, right? The, the only dream that's died here is the liberal internationalist one uh, of the sort of 30 year period between 1991 and, well, 2021, let's say. Um, and that's sad and tragic, but as people like Morgenthau would have said, or even Reinhold Niebuhr, that, that is the, the condition of global politics. Um, so uh, I don't see the, the balance between these two author also. The diagnosis of, uh, of geopolitical resurgence and the plea for sort of kinder, gentler interdependence are running quite at odds uh, conceptually. So I want some reflections on that a little bit. Who, who, yeah. Yeah, Uh Volodymyr um, Yermolenko, visiting fellow here. So uh, I liked very much the way how you questioned this win-win utopia. But uh, the question is for me, okay, we, we can ad uh, address critically this win-win utopian uh, idea, right? But uh, to, to which extent? So do you still believe that w there can be a win-win situation or that it, it's not only utopia? Because if we don't believe in it, we maybe it, it's a follow-up to the previous question. We just come back to this win-lose uh, mindset and to a kind of a social Darwinist approach to, to, to the human reality, right? That liberty is very limited Opportunity is very limited, so either you, you gain, you win, and you should just accept and the others lose. So thinking in this criticism to this win-win utopia, do you think that win-win is still possible in today's world? Thank you. And there was somebody, yeah, and there was a question here, please, in front. Sorry, mine is a very nice. Basically, it's a very naive question. If, we, if you were to reverse everything, do you think that would make things better? If we had less connectivity? Because to me, it's not about connectivity in my mind. It's because we have more players now. And it's become a multi-dimensional uh, issue. So it's very difficult to resolve. When you have two variables and two equations, I can solve it. But now, I don't know the variables, but we are looking for a solution. And I think people have become more irrational. Yeah, thank you. You have eight minutes. <laughs> 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 OK. Um, so, oh, sorry. I'm uh, sorry. Is there, uh, is there uh, sorry, please. Thanks. Um, oh, God, that's loud. Uh, so I was wondering if you would agree that um, some of the phenomena that you were speaking about were actually caused not just by global overconnectedness, but also underconnectedness on a local scale. I'm thinking here that social theorists like uh, Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck were predicting pretty accurately more than 40 years ago that um, the kind of undermining of local community as part of the individual life story uh, alongside the kind of push towards individualism caused by neoliberal capitalism and the overwhelming increase in individual access to masses of knowledge about what was happening around the world would eventually lead to the kind of resurgence of populism and far-right nationalism that, that we're seeing now. So I guess my question is, do we not need just a political therapist but also like a domestic family counsellor? <laughs> But for sep separated families. <laughs> um, okay, they're all great uh, questions. I suppose um, what, it, what you were, uh, um, so for the first question, I didn't write your name down, which was very stupid of me, but um, I think your, the two parts of your question point to, to what I think is the sort of key thing about, about uh, what about connectivity, which is its kind of essential dual, it's the dualism, and um, that's what makes it so difficult to understand and to kind of manage. That on the on the one hand, um, uh, it creates 
these winners and losers um, and um, so uh, and uh, the way of, of, of dealing with that is essentially about politics and about kind of managing it because I mean you're not going to get a win-win situation um, without doing anything about it if you have winners and losers so you have to have a, a political act of, of trying to capture some of the gains and to redistribute them and to to help people um, who are the losers lose less and to mitigate some of the effects of it um, and that is essentially a, a kind of political act rather than a geopolitical act. At the same time, we have these sort of zero-sum instincts going on in the world. Um, but we, and the realists are right that those never disappeared. It was a kind of illusion that they were disappeared and that we were simply entering a, a kind of post-geopolitical world where, where everything was, was political and where sovereignty and states had disappeared and where people, where other identities had disappeared. But where the realists are totally wrong is that the world is made up of billiard balls and that that somehow explains what's going on because the connectivity wars I was describing show that that's for the birds. If you have these kind of deep connections right into the heart of our societies and the way that geopolitics gets, gets pursued is through information warfare and through cyber attacks and through manipulating interdependence, then, you know, it's a completely different power is organised and exercised in totally different ways. And it's, that's what makes doing something about this so complicated that you can't either think about a return to a Westphalian world where sovereignty is exercised in, in billiard balls, which, which kind of, uh, uh, can really be protected from outside interference. Um, but at the same time, we're not moving towards a, a sort of cosmopolitan global politics where you can deal with, with the problems of togetherness in a, sort of, in a, in a classical way. Um, and that's where, where the therapy that I'm talking about <laughs> comes in. It's trying to, to reconcile those different things and, and to find a way of, of accommodating um, the global competition, um, but making it a bit less dangerous and a bit less risky and trying to take the edges off and, and moving towards... Uh, it, I think it's a Sisyphean task and it's one which is going to be permanently complicated because there will always be a temptation to, 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 to do these things. And I think the other bit... So I, I was very struck when I was writing the book about some of the lessons from the first phase of connectivity and what, what, what happened and what went wrong. And I think a lot of the, the, the things that people wrote about it feel very true and very real when we're looking at it. But I think there is a difference between that first phase of globalization, which was largely about industry and empire <laughs> bringing the world together in, in kind of violent ways and, the, and what we have now, which is more about globalization and technology and the internet. And I think that the, di the digitization of our everyday life is different, not just in the, the density of the connections and the, the kind of amount that we have, but I think that it has also changed our societies in quite profound ways and ways which are, which, are, which are very difficult because I think that they do, that digital connectivity has put its thumb somewhat on the, on the, on the scales in favour of, of competition rather than uh, cooperation and consensus. And, and it is, does seem to be exacerbating a lot of these polarisations at a domestic level and is kind of increasing envy um, and changing our spheres of comparison and the way that we think about ourselves, which make it much harder to, 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 to sort of work together. So that, anyway, that was, that, I probably used up all my eight minutes on that question. Um, and I can't read my handwriting very well. So um, People um, can read the book. People can read the yeah. book. <laughs> um, <it's>, okay. <laughs> Sorry. He had a Zoom at 7.30. So this is why I, where my strictness comes from. I promise that 7.25 we are going to be over, but you still have four minutes. <laughs> this is the extra time that comes from history. 
Oh, there was this question about whether we need um, with Tony Giddens and whether we need local therapy. I mean, yes. But one of the, I think, interesting things about connectivity, and particularly digital connectivity, is the way that, that uh, a lot of these uh, tensions which I'm describing literally work their work, the, the interplay between the way that individuals have been changed by connectivity and how increasingly at a kind of individual level you have all of these new tensions, polarizations, rampant individualism, all these sort of, sort of effects which you were describing, which then lead to a different kind of national politics which is uh, much more centered around identity and about taking back control and pushing back on internationalism. And then you get a kind of international political sphere which is created by those changes. And the, and the way that they're playing into each other um, exacerbates a lot of the trends that I'm talking about. So therefore, if we, if we are thinking about therapy, it has to work on all three of those levels, starting with the individual, um, but also um, using some of the same techniques at a, at a sort of global level. But I mean, that's why the therapy is obviously meant to be a metaphor rather than a literal thing. But I think it's a useful way of, of understanding if you think that essentially this is about relationships that went wrong and that we therefore need to, to, to look at some of the ways that you can write relationships, um, uh, that works obviously as much on the individual level and is as necessary on the individual levels as on the global level. But, so maybe we'll end there with therapy. Thank you very much. Let's, let's, let's uh, <laughs> thank Mark and I do believe we achieved his utopia. We <laughs> have been very much connected but also keeping a distance <laughs> because of COVID. So thank you so much. <laughs>